Hello, I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, host of Higher Education Today, a production of the University of the District of Columbia. Welcome back to Your Education Program, the program that connects you to contemporary issues, people, and institutions involved in the business of higher education. Today, we'll be talking about technology in the classroom with two terrific guests. Dr. Susan Harkness is an assistant dean here at UDC and director of the Center for Academic Technology. She assists professors throughout the university on ways to incorporate cutting-edge technologies into the classroom experience. Steve Scully is C-SPAN's political editor and Sunday host of Washington Journal, a public affairs program on C-SPAN. He teaches an innovative distance learning class through the University of Denver, Pace University, and George Mason University. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks. If, if, Susan, if I could start with you, if you could tell us a little bit about uh, the work that the Center for Academic Technology does here at UDC and, and why you think it's important to promote the increased use of technology in various classrooms. Great. The Center for Academic T Technology, also known as CAT, we are part of the Learning Resources Division, and we work really hard to bring innovative technologies into the classroom to help students learn and to help faculty be more creative in their use of technology to achieve the student learning outcomes and the, the course curriculum. We develop numerous professional development opportunities for faculty. We train faculty, for, for example, this academic year, which isn't over yet, we've already um, conducted 75 training workshops for faculty. And so they can come and they can learn different applications and how to use them in the course and to make the proper selection of technology. We also have created an online certification course so faculty wanting to teach in the online environment be can become certified in online instruction, learning the online pedagogies and the tools and techniques to, to use that type of a platform. And have you, uh, this may be a little bit of a leading question, but have you done anything with C-SPAN? And if so, what is that? And maybe we can introduce C-SPAN that way. Certainly, yes. I, I've worked with C-SPAN in the past, both directly and indirectly. Um, indirectly, I, as a professor of political science, I've streamed their archive content into my courses, whether it's an online course, a blended course, or a, a traditional course. We've also used C-SPAN 1, 2, and 3 to you know, watch hearings and, and different things that are going on in Washington, D.C., in the classroom. And more directly, I've worked with um, C-SPAN in their um, distance learning collaborative course. We were a partner in, in that for one year, where we brought our classroom into collaboration with University of Denver, Pace University, George Mason University, and, and C. Scully to interview politicals in the classroom. The students had firsthand um, work and, and questions with, with these in individuals whom that you know, they've only seen on TV or read in the newspapers or read about in books. And I've also worked with Mr. Scully at the Democratic and Republican National Conventions. Actually, we met in Boston in mm -hmm. 2004, and so we've done a lot of collaborative work together. Terrific. And Steve, if we can bring you into this sure, conversation. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, I, I know that not only do you interview tons of people usually, but I'm really interested in your love of technology. You seem to really embrace technology uh, and, and education. If you could speak a little bit about the work that you're doing at the University of Denver, uh, I think our viewers would find that very interesting. Sure, and I, I think you need to kind of take a step back because C-SPAN began really with cutting ed edge technology that seems antiquated today, 30 plus mm -hmm. years later, but the whole cable innovation in the mid to late 1970s, which was t t designed really to bring Washington to homes around the country. And, and the network began with Brian Lamb and the, and the people who really funded the network uh, with a primary mission, which is to educate the American people on their government. We started with the House of Representatives. We moved into the U.S. Senate in the mid-1980s. We now have a third network that primarily focuses on American history. We have a weekend network on book TV on C-SPAN 2 that focuses on nonfiction books. And so that really is the genesis for what this class is all about. So it's been the innovation and the technology that brought cable to homes and, and, and now satellite technology that allows us to connect with these students at uh, University of Denver and at UDC and at uh, Purdue University in Indiana and Pace University in New York City and George Mason University. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a very small cogent line that connects Washington to these different universities. Uh, broadcast quality so we can multi-platform the class, mm -hmm. put it on radio, put it on the C-SPAN networks and bring into the classroom uh, people like Newt Gingrich and, and Bob Dole and uh, Senator Hillary Clinton and uh, the late Senator Ted Kennedy and, and former right. President Jerry Ford and NBC's Brian Williams. So it, it runs the whole gamut from history and politics, journalism and public affairs, and then you have a great interaction between the students and the guests. Well, that, that's what I wanted to ask you about was the, actually that interaction. So let's assume a senator or a congressman comes on the show 
or more specifically comes to your class, how do students actually engage with that member of Congress? Well, that's where the technology comes in, uh, Steve, because it's really uh, broadcast quality. So it's uh, the comparison, if you remember the old Nightline with Ted Koppel, he was always in a studio and the guests, even if they were in Washington, would be in a different studio or a remote location. In this case, most of the guests are in our uh, Capitol Hill studio. But because we have connections at the White House or at the Pentagon uh, or uh, other locations around town, Capitol Hill, we can have the guests from those locations as well. But they basically see the students in real time. The students see the guests in real time. And so it's a very natural uh, connection between the university students and the guests because there's no, there's no delay. It's not like the internet uh, of old where there'd be that halting technology, even though today the internet uh, is, the speed is so much superior. And um, very quickly the students adapt, as you found out mm -hmm. with the students at UDC, they adapt and they, uh, they, they come prepared with good questions. And the, the technology is not a barrier. It's really just a, a way for us to bring in some very interesting people who wouldn't travel to, to Denver or wouldn't go to right. Northern Virginia or may not make it up here to Venice uh, for UDC or travel to Lafayette, Indiana. Yet they'll come to our studios on, on Capitol Hill or they'll join us from the White House like Robert Gibbs joined us uh, last fall from uh, the White House, the, the press secretary. And then they have a great dialogue and exchange. So the technology is, is not a barrier at all. And, in, and do you, but do you see in terms of the technology going back and forth, how do universities uh, that can't afford this technology, how do they engage with, uh, with, with, your, with you or, and or with C-SPAN generally? Well, they engage uh, through the studio classroom that they have set up. Uh, we want to make it broadcast quality because we want to put it on the networks. And mm -hmm. at each of these locations, including here at UDC, using this facility that we're at right now, uh, we set up robotic cameras. Or in the case of the uh, University of Denver, some of the communication students operate the cameras and direct the class. Mm -hmm. So it not only allows us to connect the students from different universities, it also allows the students from different communication departments to actually be part of a television production. It is a show in many respects mm -hmm. uh, because you do want to uh, make, make it a program that is interesting and informative. You move to the different universities, so you go to Denver and then you go to UDC and then you go to Pace University. The students come prepared. We show the students and mm -hmm. in practice how to ask good, concise, clear questions. So on all levels, I think that they benefit from the class because of the academics involved. We, we right. say it's a traditional academic course taught in a non-traditional way. I mean, they still have exams and papers and, and books to read and required uh, texts, but they also have the ability to interact with some fascinating newsmakers. Well, that's interesting. And Susan, if I could mm -hmm. turn this to you a little bit. When we're talking about the kind of interaction between students and professors, that, as you no doubt know, and I, I know both of you know, there's been a fair amount of controversy about uh, Technology in the classroom. Some, there's been a lot. Of, there have been a number of professors who've opposed the increased use of technology in the classroom on the grounds that there's less interaction between students and, and professors, that there's less face time back to back. How would you respond to, to somebody who would ask you that? Um, I think actually the, using technology in the classroom creates a, a larger space for face-to-face -face interactions. For example, if you del de deliver your lecture notes, um, you know, small modules of content such as a lecture, um, the important material that students really need to know that comes out of the, the text or that you want to emphasize, deliver that to the students beforehand via a podcast or a link that they can download because you've streamed it on your course management system. We use Blackboard here. The students can digest that on their way to the class before they come to class and then it opens the class time for more interactive collaborative work where they can actually be more specific and ask the professor very direct pointed questions about what they did not understand or what they did understand. You can really use that time better instead of lecturing. I think you know the, the, the sage on the stage, that type of model is, is long gone, mm -hmm. although I mean, it is you know, effective for some people for certain portions of classes, but to be used as a dominant paradigm for instruction is, is an outdated model. And so we can use technology to open the, the face time with students to become far more productive and interactive and collaborative and, and teaching the students the skills of critical thinking, collaboration skills, the things they really need to take them into their jobs. How about adult learners? Do they respond to some of the stuff that you're talking about? Absolutely. I, I see very little difference between the adult learners and the traditional learners. This campus, we have a, an awful lot of adult learners. Our, our, you know, I, I don't remember exact our specifics. The last time I did review them, you know, our, our average student age was 
25 to 30 years of age in a, in a female student <clears throat> who worked a full-time job. And so our students, whether they're adult learners or traditional students, embrace the use of technology equally. Our adult learners embrace it because it's more flexible. Sometimes they are working a full-time job, and so they may appreciate more a hybrid or blended course where content is streamed on the web mm -hmm. or available on the course management platform where they can digest that information, access that information, and a flexible space that works for their family and for them and around their job. And so I, I think it's not a barrier, it only enhances the opportunity for higher education for people. And the other thing too is, as you well know, this generation really embraces technology. And, and I see it with my own children and certainly with these uh, college students who grew up really with the internet and with cell phones and with cable TV and the iPad and, and the iPhone. And so they don't view that as a barrier. They view it as, as just an extension of, of what they're quite used to. And let, let me give you one example of how technology and the C-SPAN video archives really enhances the educational program. And it's a recent example because of the course that I'm teaching mm -hmm. right now focuses on Congress, the media, and the presidency. Mm -hmm. And what I've done is I've taken, uh, taken a look at, at significant moments in the modern presidency, the televised debates with uh, Kennedy and Nixon, the, mm -hmm. the presidential news conferences, the Vietnam War. And just last week I focused on Watergate. And what I was able to do is to go through the C-SPAN archives and select moments in the Nixon presidency that encapsulates what happened with Watergate and the changes that led with the creation of the Federal Election Commission and also the impact that Watergate had on the American presidency. And I was able to incorporate the video from the archives and bring in a guest from uh, Los Angeles, John Dean, who was well known, White mm -hmm. House counsel during right. the Nixon administration, joined us for an hour and a half to talk about his own experiences and the book that he wrote, Blind Ambition. So you have the students who are able to better understand mm -hmm. what happened with Watergate with a lecture discussion that I was able to, to right. uh, put together, but also using the video and the film that really captured what was happening in the country and then the chance to, to question John Dean. It was a, a very rich experience wow. with these students, mm -hmm. and they, they have a better understanding than if I were to be in front of the classroom mm -hmm. lecturing for two hours about this happened June 17, 1972, right. and Richard Nixon resigned August right. 9th. But to use the film and to understand who Nixon was, what he was saying at the time, and what led to his um, resignation, I think, provides the students with something that they're not going to get anywhere else. Well, that's very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, but if we can go back to, to, to Watergate, I, I didn't know you were you were, we were going to talk about Watergate today, but that's okay. Um, if you think about if you think about kind of images of Deep Throat in the uh, you know in the uh, in the parking lots of Washington, uh, that's when I think of uh, Watergate. That's the first thing I think of. And I think of Hal Holbrook. <laughs> but anyhow, <laughs> fair enough. But so if we th if we're thinking about this, um, how how is a student supposed to take the visual images of what they now see from your class versus what are actual facts? So let me, let me rephrase that. Mm -hmm. There may be an issue when there are film versions of things that perhaps are not exactly 100% uh, of what actually happened mm -hmm. in Watergate. So it was, a, it was a, a compilation of what happened. It can really affect what people, what people interpret. How do you deal with that issue when you might see some students who, who are, perhaps are not reading everything that you're giving them, but instead they're relying on the video? Well, hopefully they are doing the reading in advance. And what I do is I put together a list of websites. The Washington Post, among them, is probably the best mm -hmm. uh, chronicle of what happened if you want to use the Watergate as an example. And so in advance of the class, uh, they have to do their own homework. And I give them mm -hmm. pop quizzes mm -hmm. to make sure that they've done the readings, right. either with the text. Uh, one of the texts that we're using is Norm Ornstein and Tom Mann, and they write about Watergate and the impact mm -hmm. that it had on Congress and the presidency. So it's incumbent on the student to do his or her own his or her own work in advance of the class. I send them the material so that they're prepared for what's going to be in the lecture and the discussion. We then begin by doing a broad overview of what happened with Watergate, but we just deal with the facts in terms of the video. We're not going to use something from the film, All the mm -hmm. President's Men, but we will use uh, from the hearings of 1973 right. or from Richard Nixon's news conferences or from uh, the, 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 the richness of the Nixon tapes which give you, uh, you know, a first-hand oral history that they may not be able to, to uh, the students may not think about using. So Bob Haldeman's conversation with Richard Nixon in July 1972, where they begin the stages mm -hmm. of, of the cover-up. Mm -hmm. And so we put that all together in chronological order uh, in about an hour discussion, and then we followed that with, with John Dean. And then we had a discussion after that. So I think it, mm -hmm. it, it, we just deal with the facts, and then the students can uh, hopefully uh, 
benefit from all of that? Well, I think this sounds really interesting, um, but I, I, but I want to press both of you on, on this very point, if I may, about the issue of the video versus the written word. Because in a, in a more contemporary uh, issue, uh, Tufts University has now accept, started accepting video submissions for people who want to go to Tufts. Mm -hmm. And so the critics say, well, that's great. Students are now submitting videos, but what they're not doing is spending as much time doing writing. And uh, it sounds like your course is terrific, and, and it sounds like the work that you're doing here at UDC is terrific as well. But how do we make sure that, that we do two things? That we make sure that students embrace technology and be, you know, demonstrate their, com their capacity to deal with the written word at the same time? I mean, th that's a great question. And to going back to feed off of what, what Steve Scully was saying is, I, I think it's uh, the professor's job. And, and I would show this, the students, all the president's men, and, and, and compare and contrast. And, and it, I feel it's my role as an instructor, as a professor, or the professor's role to teach students how to think critically and to make those really hard decisions as to, this is what I saw here. These are the facts. This is what I saw here. This is what I've read. This is what I've read in the newspaper. These are the corrections I read in the newspaper. This is what I read in Time Magazine. This is what I saw on another um, network. And to think critically about what does this all mean and to make decisions on all this information that's out there before them that's right for them. It's not my job to tell them how to think. It's to provide a multitude of resources for the students and let them synthesize it down and make decisions that fit for them and to be able to sort through this and find the fact and, and the nuggets of information and make decisions such as why we might have this variation of all the president's men on the facts. Because it, it sells. It's, you're not going to fill movie theaters at whatever, you know, tickets sell for these days on, on just the facts on an on a oral history project. P people want Hollywood. They want it to be entertained. And so that's where Hollywood comes in. But there's always grains of salt in there, and, and, mm -hmm. and so there, there's a teaching moment and everything. So I would use a classroom space to help students think critically and learn those very important skills of how to make sense of all this information, because we're bombarded with all kinds of information all the time. But it's also, it, it's not an either or. <clears throat> I mean, I think if you're doing your job as an educator, you want to get kids excited about mm -hmm. history right. and, and politics and government. Right. And my students uh, run the gamut. I mean, the students at the University of Denver are pre-law, uh, biology students, political science and communication students. So they come to the table with different levels of understanding of American politics. And I begin the class on day one by discussing the Constitution, because I want them to understand what the framework is for our government, so that right. they can really have an understanding understanding of, in the case of Watergate, what Nixon did wrong, in the case of the Vietnam War, the mistakes that we made, in the case of uh, Iran-Contra with, with Reagan. But they also have to do papers, they have to read the right. books, they have right. to take tests. So it's not like they come to class and it's, it's a show where they can sit back and, and watch a movie. Right. They have to participate, they have to do the research in advance, they have to fulfill the requirements uh, because there, there has to be a benchmark to give a student a grade. I'm here in Washington, the students are in Denver or George Mason or here at UDC. Right. So there has to be kind of a level playing field and I think if you do both, uh, you're going to get these students excited. And I'll make one last point. It's not because of me, but I think it's because of the people we're able to bring in that the class is ranked number one mm -hmm. in the Department of uh, Political Science at the University of uh, Denver because there's so much to offer these students that they're not going to be able to get anywhere else. And that's just because of what C-SPAN's able to do by the very nature of being here in Washington that they couldn't get if they were in Denver. Fair enough. Where would you guys be on the position of, should we put course content online? Do you think we should put all course content online? Absolutely. I mean, I think the more we can put content online, the better off we are. I think content should be available and accessible to students anytime, anywhere, any place, whether they're on a, on a mobile device, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, accessing it from home, accessing it on the road. And I think the movement to making um, content more open and available to everybody it is the right way to go. It just like we have public libraries, we should have public repositories of information. MIT, Yale, mm -hmm. UC Berkeley, put information out there, the Carnegie Institution, put information out there, content out there, courses out there. Students are not able to enroll and get a, a degree from these universities, but the information is there. I, I think, you know, we live in, in, a, in a world where you have to be educated. You have to know how the world functions. You, you need to have information at all times. So I think the more we can put information out there for anybody to access, I think it's great. I think faculty at universities should make their content available online on the course management platform for students to access. 
at all times. And we, we do require a certain degree of information to be made available to students um, at the University of District of Columbia. And I, I can say that more than half of our faculty have significant amounts of their, their resources, information, content, lectures, videos, PowerPoints, reading lists, all available to students at any time. Hmm, we also have a mobile app that makes it available so they can get it on a mobile app, a smartphone, anywhere, anytime. And in fact, we've done that at C-SPAN uh, for the high school and the college level student uh, through the C-SPAN in the classroom mm -hmm. effort and also through the video library. Uh, everything that we have covered since 1987 and some select material from uh, 79 to 87 simply because we didn't start archiving as much as we should have in the early days. But all of that material is available, every hearing, every interview, uh, every news conference, every presidential speech, plus material from the National Archives. And it's a rich history mm -hmm. that's available to any uh, college level student or any professor mm -hmm. or any high school professor, teacher. And they can just simply go online or anyone who's interested in politics. It, it's just go to the video library, type in certain keywords or type in uh, general or specific mm -hmm. information and everything that you want on a topic or a guest or a public official is there and then you can use it. And we want teachers right. to use it in the classroom because as I said at the very beginning, we began with a singular mission of education and we're, we're looking for every way to expand that in terms of technology. And what advice would you have for the expansion of technology then in the humanities? We, we've been talking about the social sciences. Uh, what advice would you have for how we could expand more information in the, uh, in the humanities fields? I mean, I don't really think the expansion of technology is discipline specific. I, I think we, we, we see an awful lot of applications, simulations, and opportunities for using technology in all the disciplines. I mean, nursing, for example, you can have um, technology-rich mannequins mm -hmm. where students can learn how to perform basic nursing practice on mannequins that have heartbeats and that they can you know, interact with. You, you can dissect a frog or a cow's eye um, or a brain through a virtual platform. You can build bridges and do load tests online. You can use technology in any discipline. Um, so I, do not, I don't think it's discipline specific. I think in some, there's some, some disciplines are a little bit more challenging, but I think, you know, you know Steve can speak, I, don't, I think technology is there. It's not going to go away. Mm -hmm. It's only going to move faster and swifter into right. the future. And it's, it's, you know, we, we need to embrace it because the students are embracing it and they're driving it and they're pushing faculty. So I, I think everybody needs to step up and, and just embrace it and find what works for them. And, and as long as it's aligned to the learning outcomes, is measurable and produces knowledge, why, why not use it? Let me just give you one example. Uh, Fifteen years ago, we, we covered this event uh, the other night with uh, White House press secretaries. When uh, Dee Dee Myers was the White House press secretary, she indicated that there were probably about 50 websites when she was briefing, and now there are how many million or billion <laughs> websites, right, right. and it just shows you over the last 15 years how quickly technology has changed, and it doesn't matter whether it's history or political science or any other humanity. Yeah, I think Susan is right. You have to embrace and, and, and realize that technology mm -hmm. is moving uh, faster than many of us even could have imagined. Fair enough. And I think we've only got a few minutes left, and maybe if we could leave our viewers with your views of where you think technology is going in the classroom, in your case, Susan, in terms of what you hope UDC is going to do, and Steve, in terms of what you hope uh, C-SPAN is going to do in the, uh, in the months and years ahead. Sure. Um, I mean, I, I think going forward, we will continue to make every effort to make information resources available to students and to faculty. We have over 50,000 books, e-books. We, we digitize all our serials and our periodicals and our primary source materials, making them available to students anytime, anyplace, anywhere. We have um, support portals for students 24-7-365 for students and for faculty to, to get technology support for their classes. I think you know we will continue to create new content, new applications. Mm -hmm. you know, we created a mobile app this, this last summer to, to embrace technology, to facilitate teaching and learning. And, and I think you know, going into the future, we, we don't know, you know what the future actually holds. We can only make you know, predictions for alternative futures. But I, I think you know, technology is a paradigm in which we're mm -hmm. in, just like the Industrial Revolution mm -hmm. changed society. We are in a, a technological paradigm shift, and we are changing dramatically very fast. And, and I think 50 years from now, I, I can't imagine what's going to be there for technology, but universities will still be here, but there'll be different places, different mm -hmm. spaces, and we'll be able to you know, access information differently, provide information differently. And, and I, I just think it's, it's an exciting time to be in, and uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's the driver of the future. It's just like, um, you know, it's like the, the water that nourishes innovation. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is what it, it, it's, what's driving 
our society and, and you, you need to be educated, you need to be able to embrace it and use it because it is a powerful tool. Thanks. And I think for C-SPAN, you know, we began as, uh, with the support of the cable mm -hmm. industry. To go to your point, you have to anticipate and be able to uh, uh, embrace technology as it's come about. We have three networks, about a dozen websites, a radio station that's heard nationwide on uh, XM Satellite Radio. We have the C-SPAN in the Classroom project. We have the Distance Learning Class project. We have the video library, which allows, as I said earlier, teachers and students to tap into the, the vast resources that we have at C-SPAN. And where it's going, we really don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we, who could have imagined that Twitter or Facebook just in the last three to five years has taken off the way it has. Now that's very much part of our programming and a way to get messages out about events that we're covering on this network. But I think what we have to be able to do is to, to welcome technology and then make our product available in as many forms as possible, as easily as possible, so that students and teachers can uh, use it in any way that they see fit. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. My last, we only have literally one minute left, but in terms of, Steve, maybe you can say a word or two about news and analysis. In your mind, how is C-SPAN going to move in the direction of dealing with news and analysis, and what's the difference? Well, the difference is that we deal with the facts. We put people on the, uh, at a table like this to take questions and deal with straight facts. We, we're not an opinion network. You're not going to get that from C-SPAN. We're one of the many choices for news inf information out there, and we're going to stick to our knitting, which is play it straight down the middle, let guests come from various perspectives, mm -hmm. let the callers and the viewers and the tweeters and the emailers uh, send in their comments and as, uh, as a network and as the moderators of these discussions, our goal is to facilitate a discussion but not express a point of view. Fair enough. And, and on that note, why don't we uh, say thank you to both of you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you Steve, thank you both thank very you. much for coming Thanks. here. If you would like additional information about UDC's Center for Academic Technology or C-SPAN, please visit their websites at LRDUDC dot wrlc dot org backslash cat or cspan dot org. Thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. Please join me again for another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman and you've been watching Higher Education Today. <laughs>